jump over to rental property. Yep. Give you a quick, quick uh, assessment of liability in a rental property. Okay. What happens there? Okay. I would say it's almost, it's almost identical to the analysis I just gave you before, except now that we're not talking about uh, someone using a poor quality of concrete or metal or not following the plans correctly. Now you're just talking about a tenant on the land. You still have that internal liability and that internal liability is the, is the tenant and the sources of liability that we see here. We've seen people injuries, electrocutions. We've seen uh, uh, what do you call it? The lead paint. We've seen other hazards on the land. We've seen mold, mold for sure. Mold uh, people falling out of windows. And because of, you no, know, we've seen balconies falling down and hurting people. Um, and so that's the, it, not even you, it's the neighbor, it's the neighbor's dog. It's poor lighting. It's poor neighborhood. There's rapes, there's murders, you name all that stuff trickles back to the landlord because as landlords, we have a duty, a duty, a legal duty to make sure that the premises are habitable and safe for all of our licensees. That's people that we let in and our invitees on the land, people that we bring on the land. We have a duty to make it safe. And that landlord tenant liability, Paul, is hugely Massive. in the favor of the tenant. Yeah. So here again, we just want to, we want to isolate the liability from the client. And then we also want to isolate the client from the asset. And we want to isolate the asset from the other assets. So many times when I have clients that are involved in real estate, and this also applies to business owners that have commercial buildings, is that you, you don't put them all inside one entity. You, you, the best thing is to diversify the LLC holdings within because each property has a different risk profile. You, know, you could have, like I said, a, a, a multiplex in a very low socioeconomic demographic, which has more liability with it just based, based upon its environment. Whereas you may also have a single family home behind a gated community, which has a very low risk profile. And you don't mix those assets together. You just kind of keep them separate. We say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So it's a, it's, although it's the similar type of tools, it's just a different, um, a different, um, what do you call it? Um, a different um, impetus that's pushing that. Plan. Yeah. And, and I see, and I hear you talk about the fact a lot that somebody owns a business, you know, a lot of times they'll have it in a corporation right. rental property. A lot of times, they don't have it in a corporation. They have it in their own name or a <laughs> right. living trust. And they right. think, especially if in the trust, I'm good. Right. But you always say with a living trust, no. Right. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, Sunday, many people are very good about their housekeeping at a corporate level. But when it comes to their personal holdings, they get a little, a little lazy, a little sloppy. They put it all inside their trust and they think that's the end of it. But you're right. Because of the, because of the dominion and control over your, over your, your trust, you're the creator, <clears throat> you're the manager, you're the owner, you're the beneficiary, you can revoke it, you can put assets in, you can take assets out. It's, there's no difference between you and that trust. It's even your social security number, not even a separate EIN number. And consequently, you get sued, the trust gets sued. The trust gets sued, you get sued. It's very different than LLCs and corporations, very different. And Brad, I hear people ask a lot when it comes to rental property, they assume, okay, LLCs, the right structure, but mm -hmm. then they ask about single member versus multi-member. Is there a kind of a quick response mm -hmm. on the difference between the two? Yep, sure. And that all focuses in again on the internal versus external. That's why you always have to remember, you always have to find out that initial genesis question, who is my creditor? Who am I worried about? Because if this is an internal creditor, Paul, it makes no difference. Single member or a hundred members makes no difference whatsoever. But if you're a single member LLC and it's your personal creditor, now we're very worried about that reverse piercing, that, that outside grab, even in LLC land. As good as LLC land, uh, LLCs are been, as compared to corporations, they still have deficiencies in those other 45 states when it comes to single member challenges, single member issues on that. We call that a reverse piercing. So yeah, there's, there's a huge difference. Um, and it's, uh, it's, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, I guess okay. that's, that's the answer. Right. So, yeah. And so you got to, your recommendation is somebody has got to really do the analysis and make sure that you can't just slap an LLC up there. You've got, there's a lot that goes into it. I know you, right. the operating agreement and single versus, you know, multi and all of that. Right. 
Yeah. And sometimes I have people that uh, are real do-it-yourselfers and, and I see it, right? Because they wind up coming to us for some other reason. Maybe they are having a, a creditor threat and they're coming us to have an evaluation of what they did or they're, they did something and now they're trying to maybe refinance a property and the bank's giving them a hard time for things. So, so yeah, you, you, you do need to at least have some advice as to what to do because you don't just take away with, oh, I'll just put everything inside the LLCs. Yeah. That's, that's not the answer because that actually could have adverse consequences and taking away a lot of good things that are available to you. Um, for again, different assets, different tools that we use. Okay. Not, not one silver bullet for everything. Right. Yeah.